Okay. And Jacques, it's very good for you to rejoin us again. You've been a long time here working on this concept of mesenchymal stromal cells and their utility for a wide range of diseases, which you've talked about to us. It's exciting to hear you talk about things which uh, are coming to clinical trials at this point. Uh, and so you're Associate Dean for Therapeutics Development, and it's very nice for you to join us. Thanks so much. So, uh, <clears throat> Robert, thank you so much for the kind of introduction, as well as the invitation to meet the, with you folks and you. And I also want to shout out to uh, uh, Eric Tarula and um, uh, uh, Joshua, uh, with whom I've been brainstorming or reflecting about putting this together for you. So, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose here. And uh, simple cartoon but to highlight an important concept. So all of you are familiar with cell therapy. Think of transfusion medicine, think of uh, organ transplant or islet cell transplant. Uh, those are uh, uh, transplantation of unmanipulated uh, tissues and the FDA is not involved, it's medical practice. However, if you take cells of the body of any type and you manipulate them, culture, activate them, anything else, automatically it's classified as a pharmaceutical called PHS-351, and the FDA has oversight. And to uh, deploy that, mandatorily, you need to obtain an investigation new drug license, the same way Novartis or Eli Lilly needs for a pill or a monoclonal antibody. And that puts it in a completely different category. Now, uh, there are this field of endeavor of utilizing the cells and tissues have been manipulated and activated or morphed or expanded that as a crop and given back for therapeutic intent. There are a lot of clinical trials. This is the most recent review. And you see uh, there's a strong bias towards early phase because the, the field is still relatively young and there are some phase three studies uh, moving forward. Now, uh, again, when folks think of pharmaceutical development, they don't think of academic health centers or universities been, being an engine of such. They think of academic health centers as being facilitators where industry comes to us and we do the clinical trials for them and it goes back to industry. But with cell therapeutics, uh, academic health centers can be engaged in more than education, patient care and research. We can actually be drug manufacturers and be masters of our domain in advancing the field of cell therapeutics because we have competencies that allow us to do that. So when I was recruited here a bit more than five years ago, we launched the uh, program for advanced cell therapy. There's a website. It's a combined program where with UW Health and the School of Medicine. And there the concept is fairly straightforward. Think of us as being like a clinical stage startup company that's embedded within the university enterprise. And uh, our main goal is to MacGyver the output of discovery in the cell therapy space into first in human clinical trials to de-risk them moving forward. So the, the vision of the program is for us to become national leaders in personalized cell therapies and when I say personalized cell therapies, it's uh, 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 either cells from your own body for yourself or um, a small lot production of chosen cells from a third party donor for therapeutic use uh, for children and adults. And again, our mission is tripartite. First and foremost, we want to be jingoistic and really develop an add value to the discovery research enterprise at UW. Well, two, uh, there are internationally validated cell technologies in different uh, regulatory jurisdictions, and we've adopted, for example, some platforms that were developed in Germany that work really well, and we roll them out here for the benefit of patients. And lastly is to do uh, uh, industry and academic partnerships so, uh, what are, how do we think through 
the coupling of a cell platform and a disease at UW. So I'm, I'm highlighting this here where basically uh, the most important thing is, the most impactful thing is going after catastrophic illnesses where there's substantial morbidity, disability, or mortality, like developing a really innovative penetrating point of the blade type of platform for a meat and potato common disorder for which there are dozens of FDA approved treatments is probably not the best strategic uh, path to follow. So catastrophic, unmet need, meaning there's really no uh, clinicians don't have uh, uh, a pharmacy full of FDA approved drugs to impact outcomes. There's nothing. And importantly, it has to be aligned with uh, in-house clinical talent and vision. And there has to be a pathway for marketing approval. So um, uh, what I would propose to this audience, and this is something I've uh, been reflecting upon and talking about for a number of years, is... Uh, I think there's a sweet spot for mesenchymal stromal cells for traumatic brain injury. And then let me make the argumentarium here and the proposal for this. Now, cell therapy for injured CNS has been a field of endeavor. It's been uh, very busy for the past quarter century. Uh, cell therapy for stroke, industries into this, uh, phase three studies, uh, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, uh, many different cell types are being used, but I want to uh, point out to, to you that uh, mesenchymal stromal cells are there as well. Now, let me just do a sideline here that uh, what are MSCs? And uh, there's uh, the endogenous cells that we collect and grow a crop of, and let's speak to that. So, uh, in the bone marrow, there are different stem cell types. Most of you are aware of the hematopoietic stem cells, CD34. That's what tra bone marrow transplanters take from a sibling into a patient to reconstitute marrow to treat uh, leukemia. But those cells survive in the marrow because they're coupled to niche cells. And these are the endogenous mesodermal progenitors which are very rare. They constitute less than 0.3% of the cellularity, maybe one out of 100,000 nucleated cell. And they provide in, in trans the goodies to the hematopoietic stem cells so they can survive long-term and under certain cues proliferate. These endogenous mesenchymal cells express uh, a marker, the low uh, FND nerve growth factor receptor, and also uh, express a receptor for PDGF. It's one of these reductionist uh, identity characteristics. And in, in the bone marrow microenvironment, uh, these cells typically reside uh, either besides the uh, venules or arterioles. And again, they produce morphogens, growth factors amongst these uh, CXCL12, which is a really, really important morphogen to sustain hematopoietic uh, stem cells. It's a chemokine. So if you do a bone marrow uh, aspirate and you do single cell RNA-seq on the CD271 uh, PDGFR positive cells on human cells, you will see in red, they express a lot of genes, in blue others less. And amongst these, you can see here, not surprisingly, CXCL12, uh, leptin receptor, the PDGFR receptor. These are the endogenous dormant cells. They don't really proliferate, they're just, they're the structure of cells. And analogous cells can be found in other tissues as well. Now, I told you that the one of their characteristics is they express the PDGF receptor. So when you take these cells out, you put them in a Petri dish. You put serum on top. Serum is basically PDGF soup. So these cells respond to the serum by deploying a very robust mitogenic response. So they start proliferating. And this was first observed literally 50 years ago. And people investigated these culture-adapted cells as sort of for a skeletal development of biology because they play a role in that as well. But what was later discovered in the uh, mid-90s is that you can take these cells from a, either from yourself or a normal individual as a crop 
in the, the lab, within about two weeks, you'll get a gram of cell, 10 to the nine, which is sufficient dose to treat a patient, which is actually 10 to the nine cells is the equivalent of your entire body content of endogenous mesenchymal cells. Two weeks. If you're a bit patient, you can, from a donor, grow up a kilo of cells. And they, these are not transformed. So they're, and people want, figure it out that, you know, this is a hammer, what's an ill we can hit with it? Because they deploy these innate niche-like properties as well as the immuno, immunomodulatory properties, which could be useful for regenerative medicine in the immune modulation. So now this is uh, uh, looking at RNA expression and culture-adapted mesenchymal cells, not the endogenous. These are the cells that were put in the Petri dish, put the Persian the serum, and you grow a large crop of them. It's polyclonal. And what you get is these cells, as you see on the left, express a wide array of morphogens and chemokines, which mirrors their endogenous biology. Interestingly, these cells are extremely responsive to inflammatory cues. And if you expose them to interferon gamma in the Petri dish, they upregulate a whole array of chemokines and other molecules that play a really important role in their Im immune modulation. And when I say immune modulation, at a default, they're immune suppressive and regenerative. So this cartoon sort of kind of summarizes uh, our current understanding of how MSC cell attributes are related to their immune modulatory suppressive function as validated in animal models. So, a wide array of tissue injury uh, syndromes. So MSCs, when stimulated interferon gamma, upregulate PDL1, endoliamine deoxygenase, which converts tryptophan to kinurenin, which on its own is immune suppressive. But also MSCs, culture adapted, express constitutively or if activated a, a wide array of morphogens, chemokines, and other pathways that their activity of their own has a profound impact on monocytes, which skews them to a um, M2 regenerative anti-inflammatory phenotype as defined typically by IL-10 competency in macrophages. And I'll come back to that because that's a really essential component of how MSCs can help in tissue injury syndromes writ large, including TBI. So, Mesenchymal stromal cells in clinical trials. The first one was in 1995. These are the number of trials over time. And you see neurological studies. There have been quite a few, mostly phase one, phase two. And again, the bias there has been towards uh, stroke, uh, spinal cord injury, uh, multiple sclerosis, and a little bit in degenerative disorders like um, ALS, for example. Now, uh, our group has done a lot of work trying to understand the mechanism of action, MOA, of MSCs when administered as a transfusion product for a tissue injury syndrome. And our go-to model is colitis. And uh, again, most human clinical trials, uh, MSCs are given intravenously because that's the way it's always been done. Uh, but for in, in neurological disorders, IV route has been used, but as well as the direct uh, uh, targeting of the CNS typically via intrathecal infusion. I will propose to this audience that that is a flawed approach. So if you transfuse human MSCs intravenously in a mouse, these are umbilical cord MSCs, not surprisingly, they microembolize the lung. They get trapped in the lung, and this is what this imaging study shows here. And very promptly, how about half the cells get phagocytosed by lung resident macrophages. And these lung resident macrophages then secondarily migrate uh, to the liver within about 24 hours and within 72 hours are gone. So IV administered MSCs go to the lung, get phagocytosed, about half don't get phagocytosed. Those that don't get phagocytosed disappear within 72 hours in the lung, the rest go to the liver and they're gone. So really, you're, it's like a hit and run mechanism if you give cells uh, IV. Now, one may 
think of alternative methods of delivering uh, mesenchymal cells. And this is another study uh, done by a group in uh, Canada where they administered umbilical cord derived human MSCs in nude mice, either IV intraperitoneally, subcutaneously, or intramuscularly. And these were um, uh, labeled cells so they could track persistence over time longitudinally. And what you'll find is that, again, if you give cells IV, they persist maybe three days, subdermally a week, IP three weeks, and intramuscular a lot. So the persistence, double pressing buttons. <laughs> the persistence is uh, very different based on the site of administration. And in our model of uh, colitis, um, here what we do is we take black six mice and we basically give them uh, soap at the drinking water and they get colitis over a week. And we gave MSCs either IP subcure IV, two doses, and you allow the mice to recover with water. And our endpoint is called disease activity index. So mice that are sick have a lot of disease activity index. And what you'll find is this is a PBS that giving cells IV the maximum tolerated dose have virtually no impact on outcome. Only the IP or sub Q improve the colitis outcome. Why would that be so? Persistence. There's, there, you give cells IV, they're just not around to have much of an impact. So IP is as good as sub Q, which is much, much, much better than intravenous administration. Please remember, most human clinical trials for tissue injury syndromes, including stroke, give the cells intravenously. And uh, we ourselves did imaging studies, this is data from our group, giving uh, uh, MSCs either intraperitoneally or subcutaneously. And what we found is the cells persist about a week or so. And this is an important piece of data because often I'm asked, hey, Gallipo, if you give MSCs, IV, whatever, do they engraft? Do they stand, stay there for years? They don't. They typically persist, again, IV less than three days, uh, sub Q a week. It could be a bit longer intramuscularly. If you give a, a product straight out of the freezer that's thawed, all that is out the window and they're gone within 24 hours, no matter how you deliver them. Now, in this experiment, what we tested was the next generation of MSCs. MSCs version 2.0 are those that are functionally tuned in the Petri dish before you give them back. So. Most clinical trials just grow a crop of MSCs in their native form, they just, but if you add interferon gamma, you re reset the transcriptome on 100% of the cells and they deploy a functionality that they normally only deploy as part of their injury response pre-programming. And here, if you look at, uh, uh, outcomes of colitis, looking at body weight, uh, if you just uh, look at giving PBS, uh, the mice lose a lot of weight. MSCs native, they improve. But interferon gamma treated MSCs is basically a better mouse trap in looking at a pragmatic outcomes in a mouse model of colitis. And this correlated with histology. And what we showed was if you deplete the mouse of endogenous macrophages, and there's a pharmacological way of doing that, is giving a small molecule called a liposomal clodronate. And you give that before you give them DSS and the MSCs, the benefit of MSC therapy is abolished. Now, this is an important piece of data because this informs this cartoon. The way MSCs work, it's not that you give MSCs IV or subdermally or IM, and they migrate to the site of injury. There's actually no data that supports that that occurs substantively. However, what we found is the MSCs, even there if they're in an extravascular depot, like subcutaneously, lead to mobilization of marrow monocytes that they get tuned to become M2, and that's the monocytes that migrate to the site of injury and exert a reparative effect that's IL-10 dependent. What I'm sparing you the cell biochemistry, but what we've published in the past year is MSCs produce uh, an array of chemokines which are listed here on the left. In blue are the chemokines they express at a default if you just culture adapt them. 
And in red are uh, supplementary chemokines that are upregulated by interferon gamma. And we discovered that chemokines like CCL2 and CXCL12 form heterodimers. And it's those heterodimers that are very potent in mobilizing CCR2, which is the receptor for the chemokines, skewing them towards a, 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 a repertive phenotype and these cells mobilizing to the site of tissue injury. So from a pragmatic perspective, what we found is that uh, if you give uh, MSCs fresh out of culture, they're preferable than the thawed cells, and I spared you that. But the important insight is that giving cells IV or perseverating giving cells IV, trying to get different outcomes is flawed because their persistence is very, very short because they get cleared out by phagocytosis. But if you deliver the cells IP or subdermally, the MSCs persist longer, and it's just pharmacology. They produce these goodies that mobilize marrow macrophages that home in secondarily to the site of tissue injury. So what about MSCs in rodent TBI? So there's a lot of published research. There are reviews on the subject matter. I'm highlighting one here from 2017 that look at the human or rodent MSCs giving by uh, in different TBI rodent models, and virtually all of them show a positive impact on pragmatic clinical outcomes in regards to neuro recovery. However, most of these studies give the cells IV, which I posit to you based on our data as a suboptimal route, and many gave them intrathecally, which is really not practical or translational if you're thinking of your average TBI patient in the neuro ICU. And again, I'm just emphasizing that here, if you look at human clinical trials in neurology, the vast majority give the cells either IV or IT. And uh, the route of delivery will have a big impact. Now, there are a very large amount of studies looking at human MSCs given IV and stroke. But there is a surprisingly minuscule number of studies looking at MSCs giving specifically in the setting of TBI. And Charlie Cox in Texas has done such a study in children, but there's been very little out there, which to me was surprising. It may well be because it's difficult as a single center to accrue enough patients uh, on a uh, interventional study for uh, uh, TBI using a cell therapeutics because they were often using your, their own cells, autologous, which is not practical. So uh, these data I'm showing you here were uh, more than uh, two years in the making. I had to recruit a postdoc and we had to figure out how to uh, generate uh, uh, controlled cortical impact in mice because we wanted to test the hypothesis. If we were to give interferon gamma augmented mouse MSCs subdermally, would it affect TBI outcomes? And we use the uh, CCI model. This is just a cartoon to depict that. Uh, um, and the CCI model, we were guided towards a seminal paper that describes how to do this. And I'd like a shout out to Robert Kafowski uh, because uh, he provided access to a, a pneumatic CCI device. And we trained up on it. And basically, I know a lot of you are surgeons, so I put down sort of the IACOC surgical procedures. So you know exactly how it was done. Anesthetized, stereotaxic frame incision, craniotomy, uh, specific site, unilateral, TBI with a specific velocity and different. And again, it took a while to come up with a, a TBI where we didn't kill all the mice uh, so that the mice survived the TBI so we could do an intervention and see the outcome. And, um, and the, the uh, again, this was a pragmatic study. I went straight to the pragmatic study to see, could you impact clinically measurable outcomes? And the two endpoints we used were a rotor rod, which is familiar with most of you folks. Mice are putting on a, a twirling rod and you measure the amount of time before they fall off. And you have to do a couple of trials because the mice, there's a training effect. And um, so what we did was 
at first to validate our model, we did uh, mice that were uh, sham CCI versus CCI, and we asked, could we observe an impact on the rotor rod in untreated mice? And yes, we did. There is a, an impact on the performance test. And there is also, uh, again, we had to be mindful of not creating so much of an injury that all the mice died or couldn't do the performance test. And the other test we adopted was a grip strength which is fairly straightforward. The cartoon depicts it here. The mouse, the mouse hangs on, you pull out on its tail, and when it releases, you can basically measure the number of new mutants that it was able to generate. And again, in our hands with the TBI model that we're able to uh, develop, we were able to get a, a, a delta. So now with this in hand, we performed an interventional study. So just uh, bear with me here. So we get black six mice, uh, we actually need to do a rotor rod training at Wasteman because, again, there's a, a learning effect uh, on this. We then perform the CCI, the Medical Science Center, where they receive MSCs 24 hours later. So, and a repeat those 48 hours after that. The mice are transferred to Wasteman for adaptation. And there on day seven, the behavioral testing is done at Wasteman. Uh, so there's a lot of mice moving from one place to the next. Again, took two years to get the, get this figured out. And in our pragmatic study, and we gave two million dels, cells subcutaneously each dose. And we did three groups: uh, CCI with PBS, CCI with just the native MSCs, and CCI with interferon gamma augmented MSCs. Again, the cells were given subcutaneously. And uh, this here is the aggregate of two experiments where N is equal to 10. And what we found was on the rotor rod, uh, interferon gamma MSCs were better than native, the culture adapted MSCs that were not interferon gamma stimulated relative to PBS. This was on the rotor rod and on the grip strength, uh, same thing, the interferon gamma was significantly superior than PBS MSCs didn't exactly make it which suggests that the interferon gamma augmentation of MSCs ex vivo added a cellular attribute of MSCs that made them more potent. So this is mouse to mouse experiments. So our use for, uh, what's our experience using MSCs in humans? So back we've got a program, we've got manufacturing, a regulatory, R&D, and what we have is uh, a GMP facility that's FDA compliant, clinical expertise and regulatory, and this is where we bring it, at, bringing it all together. And the facility is embedded in the hospital, the F wing on the fourth floor. Uh, again, uh, GMP compliant. We follow guidance from the FDA how to do this is not improvised. And uh, since the launch of the program, we've now secured uh, a total of uh, four INDs and one IDE. And this one here, 23026, is uh, an IND we've secured from the FDA for the use of interferon gamma augmented MSCs to treat the xerostomia. Randy Kimple is the PI, and it's we're taking interferon gamma augmented MSCs injected straight into the salivary gland to treat xerostomia complicating curative radiotherapy for neck cancer. So this is approved, and we're actually going to be enrolling our first patient, we hope, on this within the next month. And this is a, a first in human, because nobody's used interferon gamma augmented MSCs uh, in the human subjects. And he, so this actually breaks a lot of ground to deploy this platform for other ailments where they would be of utility, like TBI. And so what are the elements to get an IND? So uh, I'm the sponsor, but I'm not the clinical PI because I, I, need, I need to manage both the cell manufacturing and quote unquote provide oversight for the clinical trial. But basically I bring in clinical investigators very early on and they're masters of their domain and I let them run their clinical trial. So unmet need, faculty engagement and accrual. And I think in neurosurgery, you have all that. We need non-clinical data and we've generated now some CCI mouse data and the third part is the manufacturing, and we've already got approval by the FDA to make this. So to 
repurpose it for another clinical indication is not onerous. So what would a, a phase one study look like? Um, it's a bit like what in oncology, and that's what we're doing here for the xerostomia study. You do a three and three design, which is dose escalation, three patients, low dose, three patients, median dose, three patients, high dose, and you do a cohort expansion. You're talking about 20 subjects to complete the phase one study. And uh, uh, TBI, the advantage of this, of course, is it's an unmet need, it's an orphan disorder. Uh, so from an impact innovation perspective, this is very high. Off the shelf allogeneic cells, the advantage of that is we have cells already in the freezer that are GMP grade and takes 24 hours to have to release them to use them. Now, if you make MSCs from your own bone marrow, it takes two weeks. It's, it's not practical for TBI, but off the shelf, we have it ready to go. And we've got a lot of basic science data showing that the mechanism of action is through the, not the MSCs go to the brain, the MSCs mobilize marrow monocyte macrophages that they go to the site of tissue injury and elicit the regenerative response. Uh, so, Absence of headwinds, there's a strong safety profile for MSCs not giving IV. And again, if you got a sick ICU patient on a ventilator, reasonably clinicians would be concerned by giving stuff IV. Uh, but subdermally, uh, the manufacturing we're doing right now is FDA sanctioned. The cells are on site available within 24 hours. And uh, technically speaking, the administration should be straightforward because this is not about injecting in the brain or an LP, it's subdermal. I would propose the same way you inject uh, heparin as DVT prophylaxis under the abdominal wall. These could be in, administered under the abdominal wall. And here's how this could look like. Two doses given a week apart. Uh, this is informed on our mouse persistent data uh, because the cells persist a week, so to have a continuous effect. You could imagine these are standard cell doses, MSCs, most clinical trials when given IV. But here we could give them subdermally and a million cells per kilo for the average adult would be about an injection of eight cc's of MSCs at 10 to the seven per ml, two doses. And see these volumes, it's not, it would be fairly straightforward, especially in a sedated intubated patient to simply administer subdermally, subcutaneously uh, at the bedside. And what are the clinical parameters? And this is where talking with Eric and uh, Josh Meadows, what would be the sweet spot of the patient you would enroll? You don't want to enroll a patient that you know is going to die because of loss of substance or fixed pupils or whatever the, the predictive parameters of imminent death, nor do you want to enroll patients you know they'll do well anyway. It's all those that mushy middle, that you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And the primary endpoints of a phase one is always safety, but really as scholars, scientists, and clinical, uh, clinical trialists, in the phase one, you're really interested about the secondary endpoints that are clinical and biological. So what would be next steps? So I would propose to this audience that if there's a, a champion, and again, talking with Eric and uh, Josh, I, we have a sense that there are people motivated in doing this, is to compose a phase one clinical trial the same way you would do it if you're doing an IIT, an investigator-initiated trial for the IRB. One could think of do expanding the mechanism of action experiments in, in rodents, but for an IND, it, the data you need is not as demanding as a scholarly publication or a grant application. So I think the data we have, based on everything else, probably would suffice to inform an IND application. However, of course, we want to do more because if you want to publish or get grants, we're going to need more neuro-specific outcomes. And I, I have some ideas, and I want to hear yours about how that could be done. We already have the interferon gamma activated allogeneic MSCs bank that are GMP grade for the other study. Uh, submitting an IND and you get an answer from the FDA within 30 days. Once you have the IND, you submit the IRB and rinse, wash, repeat. We've done this now four times. Uh, by the way, the cost of an IND application, IRB application, is zero. It's really the time of the investigators to put pen to paper. Then you want to treat the first three patients to strengthen feasibility, because that makes you then competitive to get NIH or DOD funding 
for a clinical trial uh, mechanism. And for the uh, Xerostomia study, we secured a UG3 uh, grant precisely using uh, that model approach. So there's a pathway towards a grant funding. Uh, a lot of this work was done uh, by uh, 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 Chris Abney, as well as uh, Andrea Pinati, part of my group. The preclinical work was done by uh, Jaita Jiri. And uh, uh, universities are, are historically great at discovering, but uh, I think for cell therapies, we can develop and deploy. And because of the expertise here in UW in neurosurgery, and the unmet need of TBI and otherwise healthy young adults, which is a really a Wisconsin tragedy, uh, it would be fairly straightforward to have the accrual to complete a phase one of 20 subjects within two years, which is uh, an important thing if you're going to contemplating a single center uh, study. So I'll stop here. I'm going to stop uh, sharing my slide just to bring everybody back up online. And uh, I went through this uh, at a prompt clip to give enough time for uh, questions or discussion. So, uh, Robert, back to you. Thank you, Jacques. That's uh, excellent. I think that Josh is on the uh, call. Josh, do you have some comments for us about the feasibility of such a study? I, mean, I think it's I think it's feasible. Uh, I don't really have any comments just yet. I'd like to see the uh, the final details on the study approach. Um, but I think we we definitely have enough patients uh, that we would be able to to pull this off. Yeah. And Josh, I my impression from the discussion is that there's a high safety level uh, that would allow us to proceed as, as a very preliminary safety trial. Uh, in humans, and from that we might get some efficacy data. So, is, uh, do you see any safety issues that uh, I know you want to look at the whole protocol? Right. But I mean, I always safety think, issues. I'm not thinking of. I think there are safety issues for sure. I think it all has to do with risk and benefit. And and if we have people that are high risk, uh, that could highly benefit from something like this, it may be worth that for us. A phase, you know. Phase one to two clinical trials. So. Yeah, yeah. I think you know what we were trying to establish this is safety, and uh, these are devastated patients. That if there is some increase in recovery, I'm very interested in that. But we need really good neurologic, as Jacques said, parameters about whether we're helping people or not. The initial study would be assuring ourselves we're not causing harm. Okay. Other people have comments, thoughts? Yeah. I uh, Dr. Brooks here. Um, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, speaking disembodied here, but um, the uh, I, the question I have is, what what are your thoughts based off of your studies about the timing of administration uh, uh, early on? So probably the uh, so uh, thanks for that. So the uh, the best insights. Uh, have been in the advanced clinical trial sponsored by Atherosis in a stroke where they were giving intravenously an allergenic uh, marrow drive MSC product in acute stroke. Now, granted, stroke and TBI is not the same thing, so accepting that. And they found that uh, it seems that 72 hours was a sweet spot for stroke. Uh, that a product given after 72 hours didn't seem to have as much of an impact as product given before 72, uh, set within 72 hours of the injury. Now, taking a, a, the caveat that this was stroke, which is a different disorder, they were using a thawed cell product given IV, which has an extremely brief persistence in vivo, which is a bias against them. Uh, I would posit that uh, almost certainly you would want to do this intervention as quickly as is uh, practicable within a week. I think if you're thinking of doing this in people that are, are a year out or a month out, just the biology of tissue loss and because th think about it. So you're mobilizing macrophages that are regenerative. So are you causing a neurogenesis or is it really you're mitigating tissue loss? Yeah. And I would propose that the mitigation of tissue loss is the most important thing and the window of opportunity for that to occur is relatively narrow. So I would say the favorable bias 
would be to give this as early as is conceivable, preferably within a week yeah. of the injury. But, Jack, I would I'm, not advocate doing this way out. Jack, I right, would right. even think sooner because, again, drawing from the stroke data that we're seeing, your endogenous repair mechanisms are robust for the first two to three days and then begin to be shut down um, in the confusion that the brain has over whether you're making a tumor or making or repairing neurons. And so trying to enhance that early uh, repair is really what we're doing. And I like that 72 hour window for that reason, because I think that's where you'll see the efficacy. Uh, and if you even extend that window of endogenous repair with stimulation like this, that may be measurable benefit. Uh, yeah. I, I, the question I have is basically based on my experience doing spinal cord injury studies and how difficult it's been. Some of the some of the companies have required treatment within very short time windows, and that that really. Mm -hmm. But I think so the, uh, two hours is doable. Do you not, Chuck? So the only point I'd raise is there's a there's a the the challenge that Athos has had with the stroke issue was the delay between consenting and post consent uh, material preparation. Uh, the hard limit we have is once we're told patient is enrolled, we need to. Culture, we have frozen cells. We need to put them back in culture overnight. And that's a, a, a mission critical thing because it really alters the cellular attributes of the product if it's culture recovered overnight as opposed to straight out the freezer. And we've published the cells straight out of the freezer, just don't work. It's, might as well give dead cells. So that give, there's this mandatory sort of from the moment we get a patient's consented to the moment you have cells on hand, there's going to be at least a day. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's why, and that's where, uh, uh, Athos has got tripped up because the logistics of that was uh, difficult. Now we're a single center study and that's the beauty of it is we can be very tightly coordinated because we're the ones making the cells. We're the ones that have the bank cells. And I think Nathaniel was talking about industry sponsored studies where they're, you know, if the cells aren't on site and they need to be shipped in, it, it, then it becomes, but I would. Propose not to trip yourselves up that though we prefer to give them as early as possible, I wouldn't make a hard stop inclusion being 72 hours because you're going to wind up excluding all the patients that because of the time to get consent because they came to the hospital on a Saturday or whatever that correct, uh, correct. We yeah. up to up to a week. Knowing full well that we do want to bias this in our favor by doing earlier intervention if feasible. Yeah, I think I think I think that we could get into a long discussion about the practicalities of, the, of doing the study. I think it's a good idea. I think um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the most important part would be selecting uh, that uh, very refined group of patients that you think are going to benefit from an intervention. Which, um, because of such small sample size, you know, in the initial proposal, you know, that you you run that great risk of having having a failed study uh, just mm -hmm. because of that. So. You, well, the first study is going to be safety. I mean, it's it's sure, but if somebody if somebody thing. dies in that small group, yeah, then it'd be safety's out the window. Yeah, yeah well, there to roll out. Um, yeah. and so I mean, we've thought about closely about which uh, patients we would uh, uh, pick. You know, the moderate to severe, but obviously having some parameters to exclude really the the most severe uh, of the patients, just so we can get at least some uh, usable data to inform any other future studies. And as far as the, the, the safety, I, you know, I've, I've reviewed the past literature, both animal and, and human, and of which they even have used a similar cell product in, um, the, actually the only other one that they, that's been used in TBIs is actually in, in the PEDS world. So they actually use PEDS uh, trauma uh, out in Houston. Uh, uh, and that study was just a, a, a phase one study, just a, like the one we're proposing. Uh, and they had, you know, uh, really no issues in terms of safety. Now, I propose even the, the mechanism of which we would be delivering uh, these uh, the cell products uh, it makes it even safer. Mm -hmm. Could I recommend that maybe uh, Eric and Josh get together and maybe present me some thoughts uh, over the next few weeks and 
you know, we'll see where, where we are with this. Because I think that this is the sort of research I'd like to encourage uh, as long as we have a plan for success. That would be great. That'd be excellent. I have a quick question. Uh, this yeah. is Emgad. I do uh, more than nerve trauma. Uh, what's the applicability of this for nerve trauma, like a brachial plexus injury? So the mechanism of action, we believe, is triggered by administra administration of these augmented MSCs is, again, uh, a sort of a, a default generic M2 macrophage mobilization that go to sites of tissue injury. So that's why, for example, giving MSCs works for colitis as well as TBI or any other acute tissue sterile injury you could think about, especially if there's a, um, a trauma inflammatory component. So uh, I would propose to you, uh, Amgad, that uh, any disorder mm -hmm. where there's a, a acute tissue injury, especially a sterile tissue injury, where there's a component of inflammation, the MOA of MSCs through the macrophages may well move the needle there. Yeah. I really want to point out to our junior colleagues that this is a sea change in our thinking, which I've been waiting for for a long time, where we stop thinking of inflammation as universally bad and understand that it is probably an essential part of recovery and repair. Uh, and that's a, to give you pause when you think about how much of medicine tries to limit inflammation. Uh, it's all about control and regulation rather than anything is universally good or universally bad. Excellent. Well, the, the one way to think about it is macrophages initially, from an evolutionary perspective in the vertebrates, even in the vertebrates, the M1 phase was to respond typically to uh, an infected injury. And once inflammation, infection is closed, then you get anti-inflammatory regenerative because you can't get wound healing with infection. You surgeons know that. But in the setting a sterile injury, like stroke or heart attack, the M1 response is maladaptive. It's good for a dog bite, but it's not good for a stroke. So anything that can compress down the M1, but favor the M2 part of the macrophage response, you would think along your lines of thinking, Robert, would have a substantial impact on mitigating tissue loss. Yeah. And that's, I, I think, precisely what MSCs uh, trigger is sort of that skewing of the M2 response uh, at the expense of the M1 deleterious response. Very good. I'm going to have to leave now for patients. Uh, if there are other comments, please continue, but I, I have to excuse myself. And Jacques, I want to thank you very much for Thanks, Robert. participating. Thank you. Dr. Gallopo, how do you, um, for the multi-stem atherosis uh, product, I think their most compelling data were the, not the, not what they were, their primary endpoint of uh, rank and shift at 90 days, but if you look at the improvement at one year, it was much more dramatic than you would expect. It was sort of like the outcomes were more divergent the further along you got. And with the data you presented and the the survival of the MSCs, how do we reconcile those one year outcomes, um, which were you know seemingly positive, with the no significant difference at 90 days? Yeah, so I, I'd have two comments about that. So the uh, uh, giving the cells uh, IV is not the bereft of any utility. It's just suboptimal. And they're, they're giving a thought product as well. Uh, so they didn't see an impact uh, at their primary defined endpoint. Please note that the one-year endpoint was a, a, not a primary endpoint of their study. So that's why in itself it wasn't sufficient for them to get marketing approval. It's sort of a retrospective trying to make lemonade out of lemon, lemons. And I, I think what they're thinking about is to uh, retool their study to look at that long-term endpoint. Now, this fits with the paradigm, and this is true for myocardial infarction. Uh, if you want to have an impact mitigating tissue loss, 
uh, it all happens within the first seven to 14 days after the acute injury. After that, the horse is out of the barn. So uh, maybe the impact of that short-term mitigation of tissue loss is best seen longer term for neurological disorders. And th that would be probably the most conciliative way to join those two things together. But please note their study, their primary endpoints at first we're not designed to look at these long term. It, it's really just looking at those that survived, how well they were doing. But it is encouraging. But the authors, I think, uh, like they're, they're, they're persisting in using the same approach. So it's going to be IV as a thought product. And, uh, and uh, understood. Thank I you. Think, uh, awesome. I think that's, that points to the uh, fact that I think in neurologic CNS studies that we should be looking at. Six and twelve months, and not anything sooner. Uh, I mean, if you look at the even just the more recent TBI study, just even the uh, the decompressive studies, right? Um, at six months, they weren't uh, significant, but at one year, they were. And that just points out again: we all know that you know, in order to measure uh, neurologic differences and outcomes based on whatever interventions, that we need a little bit more time. And it's not like the kidneys or the liver, where maybe 30, 60 days is, is enough. Uh, we just need uh, more time in terms of uh, CNS studies. And as Very interesting talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And as Erica pointed out, uh, though the primary endpoint is safety, and th this is going to be safe. There have been many, many patients uh, treated giving IV, which you think would be not safe, but uh, safety won't be an issue. The thing is, is you need to, because there's so many TBI patients, you can cherry pick to those that you think are unlikely to have a, a catastrophic outcome, no matter what you do, or excluding those that are going to do well, no matter what you do. So that at least you can anecdotally, if there are uh, patients that seem to do uh, very well, that uh, meet a secondary endpoint of clinical efficacy, that would be important. But the, the the truly informative things would be to be clever in mapping out predictive biomarkers of response. And that could be imaging, it could be interrogating uh, immune cells in the blood before and after, or other surrogate endpoints of uh, neurological damage or recovery. That's going to be where the true insights are going to be gathered from a mechanism action out of a phase one study. Anybody, any, anybody else have any questions? Well, if not, uh, thank you, Dr. Yalapo, for uh, uh, that wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll be okay. looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. Great presentation.